Hello, friends. So I'll be giving a snippet overview on this uh, topic, role of beta blockers in decompensated chronic liver disease. As you see, this talk I'm giving on uh, 23rd December. So the context setting is uh, we get a lot of CLDs and a claim was made by my colleague that uh, there is no role of beta blockers anymore in decompensated CLD. So this was a claim made by my colleague, uh, so which quite intrigued me because 20 years back uh, when I was training in St. John's, uh, beta blockers was a norm in any uh, chronic liver disease. And then possibly there was some studies which uh, reflected on uh, possible harm in patients with refractory ascites. Uh, but when you look into the evidence in last uh, at least five, five to 10 years, again, it has resurfaced and it was quite intriguing as to why uh, beta blockers are de-emphasized in cirrhosis of liver. And I'm not seeing being used routinely. So it is good for intensive care. So obviously, I'm not a hepatologist, but for our intensive care specialists, uh, from the evidence point of view, what is the role of beta blockers in cirrhosis? So I tell in ICU, beta blockers are very good for most ICU patients. I've done a video on beta blockers in traumatic brain injury. I've done video on beta blockers in sepsis and uh, beta blockers uh, in uh, traumatic brain injury, so on and so forth. So cirrhosis also, beta blockers uh, is recommended across across the guidelines, friends, at this point of time. So this is fairly intriguing that our learned professionals not necessarily may have been updated on the what is the current evidence. So I'll just take you through what is the prevailing evidence in this snippet overview. Uh, so I bring greetings from these two hospitals I represent, Manipal Hospital, Ishwantpur and Elahanka. So what is the pathophysiological rationale? I tell all my trainees that the first choice of drug, especially in ICU for... Uh, blood pressure or most of these uh, sympathetic overdrive conditions are beta blockers. So why this rationale? So in cirrhosis of liver where there is decompensation or even in compensated, there is increase in the cardiac output. And uh, along with this, there is increase in the portal venous blood flow. So the portal blood flow increases. This leads to portal hypertension and the sequelae and the vicious conundrum. And along with this, there is planknic. This is just a pictorial representation of a planknic vasodilatation. And this also adds on to the whole vicious conundrum. So how beta blockers, and when I talk about beta blockers in chronic liver disease, it is non-selective beta blockers, which is propranolol, nadalol, or carvedilol. So they act on three receptors, beta-1 receptors, beta-2 receptors, and alpha-1. So alpha-1 is mainly carvedilol. So by blocking beta-1 receptors, there is some tempering down or uh, min minimizing the increased cardiac output that tends to happen in chronic liver disease by blocking the beta-1 blockers. And the beta-2 blockers reduces or mitigates this spanklink vasodilatation and helps in mitigating this portal venous flow and reduces the portal hypertension. And carvedilol acts on the alpha-1 receptor also, causing vasoconstriction. This is shown to reduce intrahepatic resistance. So this is the physiological ra rationale, pathophysical rationale as to how beta blocker helps. It sort of uh, underwhelms the cardiac output, reduces the portal venous blood flow by reducing the splanchnic vasodilatation and by increasing intrahepatic resistance uh, when carvedilol is used by adding, acting on the alpha-1 receptor. So what is the clinical effect? The summary clinical effect is use of non-selective beta blockers has shown to cause 15 to 20% reduction in the portal pressure. It is shown to reduce the hepatic vein portal gradient by more than 20%. So there are multiple basic science studies which have shown reduction of portal vein pressure and hepatic vein portal gradient. And this has translated into 50% reduction in the bleed, which is a phenomenal sort of a outcome that they have demonstrated in some studies, which I'll cite some studies to uh, just convince all of us that beta blockers are here to stay in compensated and decompensated liver disease for various conditions. So now, so these are the references, friends. I've given you the most recent references which has come in American Journal of Medical Science in 2024. And this is a study which has come from Denmark in 2022. And this is the one which has come from Greece in 2023. 
So about the use in decompensated cirrhosis with GI bleed. So non-selective beta blockers has been recommended as a first line therapy, as a primary prophylaxis in medium and large varices. So this is a recommendation that has come from American Association of Study for Liver Disease in cirrhosis of liver with portal hypertension. Most recommendations come from these two organizations, American Association of Study for Liver Disease and Bavino 7 recommendations. So you can Google and see. So these are the standard sort of a recommendation that seems to come out. And it is a first line primary prophylaxis for medium and large varices. And it has shown comparable efficacy with endovascular ligation to prevent first bleed. So it has a profound sort of an impact on minimizing or preventing the first bleed. And the studies have shown carvedilol is superior to propranolol in reducing the portal vein pressure, which is easily available. And even for secondary prophylaxis, this is from the Greek, non-selective beta blockers plus endovascular ligation was effective in reducing the re-bleeding happens and has shown to improve survival. So this is the evidence we have, a quite a robust evidence and recommendations from the AAST and Bavino that uh, use of beta blockers has shown to reduce the first bleed and even the re-bleeding subsequently with EVL. So it is here to stay at this point of time. And what about the ascites? So one of my colleagues said in ascites we cannot use. And I think this is a myth and we have to debunk this myth that uh, prevails possibly in some of our intensive care colleagues. Ascites and the uh, window hypothesis and these are the three studies that are there to support. Earlier studies did show uh, that beta blockers may worsen outcome in refractory ascites. So basically, we will look into what, so when there is a hemodynamic stability, there is no reason why one should not give the beta blockers. These were earlier studies which showed where hemodynamic optimization was not done in refractory ascites. Large cohort studies and meta-analysis, most recent meta-analysis have very clearly shown that non-selective beta blockers are safe if patient is not hypotensive, are we stupid to use beta blockers when patient is hypotensive? None of the intensivists would use that. So obviously when there is hemodynamically stable, only we would use non-selective beta blockers. So it is safe if MAP is more than 65 and if serum sodium is more than 130 millimoles per liter. So the studies have very clearly shown hemodynamic stability, please use beta blockers even in refractory ascites. And it has shown to improve survival. How it improves survival? By preventing gut translocation and preventing spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. So it is so vital. 20 years back, we used to do this. Every CLD patient had beta blockers on board. So maybe we should revisit this. Studies, even the most recent studies and guidelines recommend for ascites, non-selective beta blockers are shown to reduce SPP, reduce gut translocation and prevent SPP. And non-selective uh, beta blockers are shown to reduce SPP incidence reduce the need for ICU requirement and reduce the need for hospitalization has been clearly shown. What is the mechanism? Mechanism is again by reducing your portal pressure and we know beta blockers reduces the sympathetic overdrive and has shown to reduce the gut translocation of microbes which is the cause for spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. And this is the reference friends, a meta-analysis by UK group, non-selective beta blockers has shown 10 to 20% survival benefits in patients with ascites, friends. And But having said all this, why there was this sort of a thought in some of our colleagues as to why in ascites it should not be used? Because obviously, as I said, if there is hemodynamic stability, there is no reason why we should not use. Only you have to exercise caution if they come to ICU with hypotension, MAP less than 65, or if someone comes with hepatorenal syndrome, AKI, one has to be cautious while using beta blocker, and one has to exercise caution if serum sodium is less than 130, and some caution to be exercised when there is severe alcoholic hepatitis, or when large volume paracentesis is being done without albumin replacement, where you are foreseeing or anticipating hemodynamic instability, of course, none of the intensive care colleagues or our brilliant intensive care colleagues would never add beta blockers in someone where there is a foreseen or expected or anticipated hypotension. So these are all fairly intuitive for our intensive care friends. We wouldn't use the here. But Having said that, when none of these are there, beta blockers are here to stay friends. So what is the drug choice and dosing? Propranolol is the suggested drug to be started at 20 mg twice a day to be calibrated to the heart rate of 55 to 60 beats per minute is what the recommendation suggests. 
And if you have a choice between propranolol and carbidolol, carbidolol is preferred because I showed one of the studies which is shown to be superior in reducing the uh, varicial bleed as compared to propranolol. So it can start at uh, 6.25 mg OD and maximum to take it up or crank it up to 12.5 mg OD is what the recommendation suggests. So, Bavino 7 guidance or AASLD, which are the standard recommendations for use of beta blockers or in CLD, they suggest prefer carbidilol as primary prophylaxis. So, what does see? These are the guidelines which came in 2023, American Association for Study of Liver Disease and Bavino 7 suggest non selective beta blockers as recommendation for both compensated and decompensated liver disease to prevent. First bleed to prevent primary bleed and even for rebleeding along with EVL, beta blockers has to be put in place and it has shown to improve survival. So, what is the for all my intensive care friends? What is a snippet sort of a take-home message for all patients who are eligible with compensated or decompensated? Consider adding beta blocker carvidolol to be preferred over propranolol if you have a choice. And make sure that patient has a MAP, is not hypotensive MAP more than 65. Make sure patient has sodium more than 130. And more, sorry, I've repeated MAP more than 65. So if these are fulfilled, beta blockers can be considered. And you may have to consider low dose in patients who have refractory ascites and hemodynamic stability. So the key takeaway, friends, non-selective beta blockers in decompensated liver disease has shown to be life-saving. And one of my colleague who said non-selective beta blockers are harmful in ascites is outdated. So please remember it is here to stay. All the recent meta-analysis, large cohort studies which have shown you clearly shows survival benefit even in patients with refractory ascites by reducing the risk of SBP and gut translocation and reduces the risk of first bleed and even the re-bleeding. So please take this out of your mind and this is a myth. And when you are obviously added beta blockers, monitor mean arterial pressure, renal function test, sodium and infection status. Non-selective beta blockers are shown to reduce portal pressure by up to 20%, reduces the risk of SPP incidence, reduces decompensation episodes and has shown to improve survival. But treatment is dynamic. Obviously, we will hold if there is hypotension, if sodium less than 130, if he or anticipated hemodynamic stability, we would hold and then we would restart. Please restart once stability is attained. So this is the take-home message, friends. Uh, so I just wanted to debunk the myth. Some of my professional colleagues have that beta blockers cannot be used in uh, coronary liver disease. And I'm, I'm not seeing being routinely put for most of our CLD. Maybe we should relook into this and maybe we can do our audits to see if all our decompensated CLDs are on beta blockers to improve their outcome, friends. So thank you, one and all. I request you all to submit your valuable work to Journal of Acute Care. And you can visit my website, of course, to rehear to this lecture. So the only true wisdom is in knowing that you know nothing. So only then we keep learning, we keep updating. And again, this was done to debunk the myth that was some of my professional colleagues' uh, expressions. Thank you. Thank you, Anandola.